I'm sitting here at the um, at the farm uh, near the well. The distillery is very close to me. I can actually see it to my side where the whiskey is aging. And uh, this is a real treat. I know that we're living through a very uh, uh, unusual, difficult time with this virus. And uh, but it, the good news, or the silver lining, I would I would say, is uh, things like this. We we just started this uh, series last week. Um, and, uh, uh, we talked about what, uh, what the barreling, uh, what the barrel aging does and the various, the various, uh, things we think about with, uh, barrel aging. And now today, uh, we're really excited to talk about barley, um, and, uh, malted barley as well, uh, in particular. Um, it, it, barley is, uh, well, we grow it here on the farm and it's, um, uh, we're going to touch on a number of things, but barley is is a very special grain, and for me, I think it's what well, we can talk about various taste um, uh, producers or the things that create taste in our in uh, in our whiskey. But barley is a massive part of it, and and uh, it's a very special uh, source of of sugar and and flavor for our whiskey. So we're going to dedicate today to talk about to talk about it. Um, so we're, in, as I may have said, we're in Hood River, Oregon. Um, we are a single malt uh, whiskey producer here. Uh, we've been uh, we've been in existence for six, seven years, I think. Time flies, and uh, our whiskey's been on the market for three, four years now. We have uh, three batches on the market, uh, part of what's called we're calling the Evergreen series. Um, so we have whiskeys that are, we're, we're just doing American single malt. That's all we'll ever do. We, we have, uh, finite runs, uh, that we, that we release to the, uh, to the uh, market. And, uh, once they're gone, they're gone. Um, and one of the unique, some of the unique things about us, we collaborate with various distilleries, various other malt whiskey producers in the country, uh, to produce our grain bill. And then we have that new make spirit shipped back here to the farm in Hood River where it's aged. And then we blend and bottle here on the farm. Um, so a uh, bit of a unique model, but uh, the fact that we grow barley here and, and, uh, and, and I should say uh, American single malt is made with just uh, malted barley. Um, so it's, uh, this, is a very, this is a very good topic for us. Um, so this we call it the magical magical grit masher magical grain bill um i don't know if i would say it's magical but we think it's special one of the things that um so malt whiskey has been in existence for a very very long time most people are familiar with scotches and irish whiskeys and um now we're doing this in the united states in the united states which is a bit different or a bit new and uh, as with many things that we Americans do, we, uh, we put our own flair on it. Um, things started, uh, the American single malt category started with McCarthy's and uh, Stranahan's and St. George. I think, uh, uh, Campbell, you have a history with Stranahan's, is that right? Uh, yeah, so I worked at Stranahan's for a couple of years uh, after I got my master's uh, in Scotland, actually, um, yeah. and helped them kind of grow their expansion um, after being bought out by a larger company and kind of bringing the American single malt category to kind of a yeah. broader a broader audience. So Stranahan's was the whiskey. For, I had tasted many whiskeys, but then when I tasted Stranahan's at a buddy's house in Boulder, Boulder one night, I had never tasted anything so good. And and, and it was one of the major drivers for me to want to to make this type of whiskey. Um, so. Uh, like I said, at Wanderback, we're, we're collaborating with various distilleries to make our grain bill, um, but we try to make the same grain bill wherever we're, we're producing it. Um, American single malt is made, as I said, with just uh, malted barley. There's no age requirement. Uh, it's one distiller. Uh, that, that's the single malt portion of it. We're making our whiskey with just pot stills um, at less than 160 proof off the still. We age, we talked a lot about this last week, but we age in a comp, mainly new oak casks. We're putting most of our new make spirit on new oak uh, standard size casks. Uh, and then we will use various other neutral and finishing casks. Um, and uh, typically we're barreling our whiskey at 60 to 63% uh, alcohol 
initially. And that stays fairly constant uh, until we're finished aging. Um, and then we'll, we'll uh, dilute depending on what we're making. So barley, as most of you know, is a grain. It, it, looks, uh, it looks similar to wheat and rye. There's some distinctions, but it looks, there are many similarities. Um, and uh, I'd love to maybe have Pat, if you don't mind. Pat Hayes is, so when I first started, when we started to think about doing this, I didn't have a clue how to grow much of anything, and uh, I needed help, and Pat Hayes was kind enough to answer my phone calls and uh, really, really helped me a ton with um, uh, setting ourselves up to grow barley here at, uh, in Hood River at the farm. Uh, we even have a combine now, and uh, so I'd love you, Pat, if you don't mind, I don't mean to put you on the spot, uh, and Campbell as well. I know Campbell is starting, so we have some special guests. Pat Hayes, Campbell Morrissey, Pat Hayes has been at, well, Pat, maybe Pat, you could give us, give us a little idea of who you are and what you do and, and what's happening at, uh, at the uh, uh, place where you're doing most of your work. Sure, yeah, well, well what fun to be on this uh, and uh, a shout out to all the mothers out there on Mother's Day. So oh, it's an exciting uh, yes, opportunity to uh, be celebrating that kind of thing. So I've been doing uh, barley breeding and genetics here at Oregon State University for uh, you know, just uh, about a year. Uh, I started this a year before our son was born. So that would be 33 years now. Uh -huh. And uh, it just keeps getting better. And uh, we started out uh, reading barley really in response to uh, the, the principal uh, economic drivers. And way back in the day, those were feed barley. So the Pacific Northwest is a big feed barley production region. Then fast forward a little bit. And then it was malting barley for for big beer, and those were all six row barleys. And, and fast forward a little bit more, and big beer said that they wanted two row barley. And then fast forward a tad, and then you had the emergence of the craft sector, and then the Brewers Association. And, and then just suddenly barley just really opened up, if you will, and the kinds of things that uh, we could explore. And then you had the craft malting industry that was uh, emerging. And so you had Link, and you had Mainstem, and, and uh, you had the mecca grade folks and so forth. So suddenly barley breeding and genetics has just, you know, become a, a much, uh, let me say, a broader palette of things to do than we had formerly. And so Campbell is uh, going to be a new graduate student with us uh, starting this summer. And so he brings just a wealth of experience to our program. So we've got the raw material side and we can talk about barley and barley varieties as this conversation moves forward. And then when we start talking about the barley and the malt bill, then if I can defer to Campbell and then to Brian and, and to Phil and so forth, and then we can keep coming back to the cask and the bottles that you people are putting together. So, um, Pat, would you, would you be able to give us sort of a, sort of a, a, a timeline of, so you mentioned, you, you know, or, as most people know who are on this call, Oregon has a very strong um, craft beer uh, history, um, Bend, Oregon, and, and uh, Hood River now, and, uh, and other places, of course. But um, can you give us a sense, just timeline-wise, how, what were the driving forces? Was it, I mean, uh, was it the fact that we were growing barley here in the Northwest, uh, and we were looking for other ways of, of uh, using it other than as a, as a, as a uh, feed grain? Uh, how the beer industry affected uh, the, the changes and so on. Can, can you give us sort of a sense of a, a history and a timeline? Sure, yeah. So say 30 years ago, there was a barley called Steptoe that was grown fence row to fence row in the Pacific Northwest. And it was a, an evil six row that malted like a rock. And so there was no hope of doing anything with Steptoe barley, except uh, if you're lucky feeding it to a cow. And so feed barley was a money losing proposition and on the whole it continues to be that. So we were lucky early on to uh, set up a relationship with the American Malt Barley Association and Mike Davis, uh, who still heads up that organization. And they provided uh, some funding for us that's continued until today. And so that's just been like a backbone of our program to then be active in malting barley. And so we saw a shift even in the Pacific Northwest as Steptoe receded and a variety called Baroness came on. And uh, that was a two row out of Germany, which turns out can be malted and, and make some interesting beers. 
Uh, and that just redefined barley in beer a little bit. So we've kept up this kind of mainstream um, research that uh, with Great Western Malting has been a local champion for us, American Malt Barley Association, worked with AB InBev for a number of years uh, directly. And so that really supported a big malting barley effort. And so from that then we're able to leverage uh, greater connections with the craft malting community and then with the craft brewing industry. So one of the beauties of, of really public sector research is that then we can cover that full spectrum of end users. And I think as long as everybody knows what we're doing with whom, uh, we're all good. So was, um, okay, great. Well, that's, uh, um, that's a nice overview. Would you, would you be, Campbell, would you be able to give us a sense for, um, you're about to start working now with, uh, with Pat and the group um, uh, at Oregon State. Can you give us a sense for your background and what you plan on, because you're, you're uh, about to start, I believe, your PhD program now at, at, uh, at there. So your field of interest and, uh, and those sorts of things. Uh, that's right. So I'll be coming on as a lowly graduate student again, uh, but uh -huh. pursuing a PhD with Pat, specifically working on kind of the flavor outcomes and processing outcomes that we can trace back to the different genotypes of barley, as well as the different environments that they're grown in. Um, so really exploring, you know, how barley even prior to the malting process can really contribute a lot to flavor and efficacy in the in your case, the still house, um, but also in the brew house. Um, so my background has been almost all uh, brewing and distilling from the actual production side. Um, so I've never worked in a malt house or, you know, I've had the opportunity to tour them quite a few times, but uh, really wanting to see how we can then get more flavor outcomes in spirit and then in beer. Um, and I think that's just really interesting. I mean, I'm wearing my Crosby hops hat. And, you know, everyone knows beer hops are the, the real, the cool ingredient. Um, but really knowing that hops are fairly limited, um, getting more and more expensive. And I'm much bigger proponent of, you know, malt driven beers and malt driven spirit and really trying to get some of the craft maltsters the access to these tools to then really sell a value added product uh, down the line. So you mentioned um, not only the malting process, adding flavors, but also um, the various things we do prior to malting. So where it's grown, how it's grown, the varieties. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? We're, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're what we're doing here in terms of what we're growing and the fact we're using some unmalted barley in, in our our new, newest whiskey just made here with the collaboration here with McCarthy's. Um, but can you just talk a little bit about that and, and maybe the idea of terroir and where that, how that would play into this? Uh, well, you're definitely going to give me a little test and see how I do and no. uh, recounting a lot of Pat's research and stuff that's, you know, uh, prior to me coming on. Um, but really starting back in, you know, 2016, um, there was some early research looking at different crosses um, of different varieties and then growing them in different regions um, in Oregon, or particularly. Um, so kind of stuff in the Willamette Valley, but also stuff on the eastern side of the state where completely different growing conditions with, you know, much less water, um, you know, irrigation versus natural uh, rainfall and looking at those kind of outcomes and then using what's really come on in the last couple of years, which is called the hot steep method, um, which is, you know, for lack of a better description, basically making a barley tea um, and using a, a derived flavor lexicon to actually apply the sensory process that we've all used on the beer side and then the new make and then finished spirit side, where we really look at that as a sensory science, um, applying that back to uh, the actual raw barley um, and then raw and, prior, and then post malting. So we're able to start really starting to pick out yeah, sure. different flavor outcomes um, based on those varieties. And then there's some research that's just getting wrapped up now. Um, and then we have some research that I'll be taking over um, looking at some uh, kind of heirloom crosses from European varieties with some varieties from the US and Oregon and seeing how we can see if we can get, get even better flavor outcomes from those. That's great, I, that's great. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm anxious to get the, uh, we've got some uh, representation from the malt houses here as well, but I, I am very interested in this um, 
unmalted barley flavor characterization. But so how are you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, taste That's is a very subjective thing, as I'm sure you're aware. I mean, we, we think about taste, well, we think about nose and taste a lot uh, in, in our whiskey world. How are you, how are you quantifying flavor and, and measuring flavor and, and characterizing flavor as, as it pertains to, you know, the, the, the barley and where it's grown, dry versus wet and so on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, nice thing is we have, we're partnering with very, very, very smart people at Colorado State um, who are doing all the metabolomics research um, and actually doing the analytical chemistry side where they're doing, using um, a separation technology called gas chromatograph mass spectrometry okay. um, in order to actually isolate compounds. Um, and then we're mapping that with the sensory outcomes and seeing where we can actually identify specific compounds that are giving positive or negative attributes into flavor. Um, and then long term, being able to trace that into specific genotypes or specific environmental growing conditions. Very cool. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's great. I, I love to hear about it. I also love the fact that you guys are, are collaborating for these various, uh, for these various things. Should we, um, should we get into the malting part of it now? We have, we have two, People who I haven't actually had much uh, connection with, but I'm very uh, looking forward to getting a more, more of a connection with Brian Estes from Link Malt and Phil Newman uh, from Mainstem Malt. Are you all, are you both on? I see Brian. Is Phil on? Oh, here's Phil. Yeah. Hey, how are you, Phil? Hey, doing well. How are you, Phil? I'm, I'm great. I love, I, uh, you've got a very good name. Uh, Fantastic. We, um, names. How, I, I wonder how best to structure this because, so, for the listener, um, well, maybe, maybe, maybe what would be good is if the two of you could introduce yourselves and give us a um, uh, an idea of what you're doing um, in, in this area of of, of the malting uh, uh, world. What things are somewhat unique, maybe, about what you're doing, and and then maybe we'll get a We'll, we'll get a chat going about just about the basic malting process, and then and then we'll talk about the uh, the difference with the specialty malts that we're interested in. So uh, maybe Brian, would you mind? Uh, is it Brian or Phil? Would you yeah. mind? Yeah, Brian. Yeah, I'm happy to happy to dive in. Um, hey, everybody. Um, uh, thanks to thanks to Phil and Sasha for for hosting this and for bringing together such a cool mix of folks from OSU, a couple of maltsters. Um, it's I think part of why this conversation is so exciting to me is because all of the needed elements for a lot of innovation and ultimately really interesting whiskey are all happening right here in the greater Northwest. So um, it's neat to especially when we're all locked in our houses to get to all be in, in one place to talk about it. Um, it so I work with the Link, the Link uh, Farmers Cooperative, which is based up in Spokane, so Northeastern Washington State. And our co-op exists to help create new and broader markets for growers um, here in the Northwest. So we got into uh, malting uh, barley and other cereal crops as a way to help our grain growers um, connect with brewers and distillers because for them to be useful um, for single malt whiskey or for making beer, um, their grain needs to undergo that process of, of malting. So um, that's what got us into this. Um, and we have discovered such a fascinating world and opportunity for our region having done that. Um, what we specialize in is making malts that are always specific to a specific varietal, but also a specific uh, farmer um, and a specific uh, area of, of kind of the greater inland Northwest. So Eastern Washington state, kind of the extreme uh, Northeastern corner of Oregon state um, and looking at, at, looking at what comes out. I think um, Phil, something that, uh, that, that you were saying stood out to me, that idea of, well, you know, is taste something that's, that's pretty subjective, right? Um, and I find that that that's absolutely true, but how you get to any one flavor um, is is hardly an arbitrary step. And I think that um, with the way malting happens generally, we've kind of lost track of the diversity of opportunities. Um, and by um, being able to malt at a scale where we're working with these specific grower partnerships, but then also working right now, we're working across. I think we'll malt it'll be either be eight or nine different barleys in uh, 2020 um, to be able to look at 
the sensory and technical performance attributes um, across those varietal uh, expressions and, 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 and across where they're, where they're being grown and how they're being produced is something that um, is kind of what we're all about. And um, Campbell referred to the uh, hot steep sensory method and that's something that um, if you ever have the opportunity, um, uh, especially as, as a way to get out ahead of waiting for years and years for uh, whiskey to mature, um, to get that idea of how different malts, um, even if they're treated the same way in the malt house, um, uh, express themselves from a sensory perspective by, by varietal is something that I, I highly recommend. Um, something that we try to do for our visitors up to the malt house um, whenever we're allowed to travel again. We're always happy to have folks through, through the malt house in Spokane. But um, it's distillers like Wanderback who are choosing to make that sort of particular, um, ask those particular questions and to get to that level of specificity that I think um, uh, is creating really interesting opportunities from a consumer perspective and what uh, finished whiskey looks like. Um, but I think speaking on behalf of, of my role at the co-op, the other thing to emphasize is that um, uh, it's creating all sorts of opportunities for agriculture in the region as well and um, giving opportunities and connections for, for grain growers that haven't existed until very um, recently in some ways. And um, I know Pat, Pat referenced the challenges of growing barley in the Northwest from an economical standpoint. Uh, this is a sort of conversation that's that's changing now. So, yeah. That's yeah, that's great. Um, I actually think it was Pat who told me to, because I, you know, coming up with a grain bill initially was uh, challenging, uh, as you can imagine, uh, just with the, you know, the choices we have, the great beers mm -hmm. we had to choose from, and some great single malts, although there were not a ton, and you know, beer is a uh, beer is a, I, I, I love beer, as I'm sure most people do on this call. Um, and I love uh, Northwest beer in particular. But, you know, when you add hops to something, it, uh, it sometimes and I love I love an IPA, uh, it changes it. And, and the, um, the the steep tea, the barley tea was was extremely helpful for me to get my head around the various flavors available uh, with these uh, malts, especially the, uh, the specialty malts, you know, because I mean, as you know, there's such an endless, such a, just such a variety that we can choose from. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll go into, I think we'll go, yeah, we will go into the specific grain bill that we use and why, um, but I'm, I'm going to be really uh, interested to get people's opinion on that. But uh, before, uh, Phil, can we, uh, can we get some, uh, would you mind giving us a sense for who you are and what, what you're up to? Yeah, sounds good. So my name is Phil Newman, Main Stem Malt. Uh, we got into Main Stem and malting in general from a, a little bit of an unconventional angle in our industry. So we're not farmers and um, we're not brewers or distillers, but uh, my background's in natural resources and Alyssa, my wife and business partner, she uh, works in the organic certification industry for Oregon Tilth. And Mainstem, long story short, became a way for us to add value to a grain crop for growers and then uh, by connecting them to markets that value um, who they are as family farms and also their conservation ethic. And uh, the goal was to make that connection and then and then just start selling malt and buying grain and working with farmers on uh, very specific standards on, you know, implementing a conservation project on this waterway, uh, reducing erosion, so on and so forth. And so you have this like market market based approach to conservation. And that was the dream behind Main Stem. Uh, we we started off as a a uh, supply chain manager, we call it. So. We don't do our own malting. We work with partners like Link and Skagit Valley and now Montana Craft Malt to do our malting for us. But we maintain a, a very high degree of integrity in how we manage the supply chains. And also the goal is to pass along a compelling story to, to end consumers, um, but also yeah, distillers and, and brewers themselves. Uh, so we got into it for conservation, but it's, <laughs> it's uh, the next chapter was really realizing how um, how competitive we would have to be in the marketplace to, to actually produce something uh, really special in the malt that we sell and something that was going to command a premium so we could 
uh, afford to pay for the premium grain we were buying because farmers were doing conservation work for us. Uh, so yeah, we really, we had to think a lot about how we were going to innovate. And we took a, a pretty, the foundation was basically these grain contracts. We started with the Craft Maltsters Guild. So, so yeah, we, we decided to move forward with Mainstem in 2014 joined the Craft Monsters Guild in 2015. A bunch of other folks uh, at this time were, were starting, um, I, this is like the second wave Craft Monsters. Uh, link is on that page too. So I went to uh, Malting Academy with Joel, the, the Maltster at, uh, head Maltster at, at Link. And uh, yeah, we were, uh, uh, so at that point, uh, we were all just kind of uh, figuring out what the heck to do um, and and we had a template contract, grain contract, through the Craft Monsters Guild that we just started um, started signing with uh, some of these local growers that we met through the Same and Safe Certified Program, and uh, that was a partnership we struck early on to sort of uh, it was our third party certification, um, and uh, so we formed a relationship with two and then three growers and um, now about eight that are on rotation. Uh, but what what we started doing was collecting grain lots, basically. So each each grain that we work with as a maltster is a snapshot of time and place and varietal, but also the production practices. So we try to we contract for a grain, uh, we follow it, we take uh, lots of pictures and videos, we go out and meet the farmer, meet with the farmer, see the crop multiple times a year. Uh, then we collect a lot of data on the on the crop, and the goal is really like uh, people like Pat and and uh, his his counterparts at at CSU and also Montana State. Uh, the university is really pushing barley varietal flavor. Um, uh, you know we're, uh, we're we're getting enough of a signal from them that there is an impact of varietal and and environment on flavor. Uh, we don't know. There are so many connections, uh, especially once you, or so many different influencers, uh, variables. Uh, once you go through from uh, growing to malting to brewing and distilling, but we know it makes a difference. And so, what we're doing is similar to a lot of what uh, a lot of what the uh, American single malt whiskey distillers are doing, and that's uh, taking a shotgun approach, doing a bunch of different things, tracking what you did, and and then figure out what. Um, what's making the big differences or what the differences that people enjoy. So that's probably enough for now, but it gives you a sense of where we're coming from. So was your, was your big, that's great, Phil. Was your, was your big challenge finding the producers or finding the buyers of the grain once, once it was ready to be used? Any monster will tell you absolutely it's finding the buyers for your malt because yeah. uh, as soon as you announce that you're going to add value to a crop, you get uh, mobbed by by growers looking to sell uh, their crop for more money. So yeah, uh, it's it's not a it's not a great commodity market out there. So there's a lot of growers interested in this kind of stuff. The processing capacity was a challenge. Now it's not so much. Um, yeah, in the past few years, we've put a lot of capacity in as an industry. And uh, now it's just uh, adoption. So it's, uh, it's distillers and, and brewers, uh, you know, voting so with their dollar that they want something local. Is, it, is this capacity for malting or growing? Uh, yeah, malting capacity. Yeah, yeah, because that's, that's the expensive step, obviously. And uncertain, yeah. Just yeah. Uh, five years ago, there weren't, you couldn't, there weren't options on who would build your equipment for you. It was all design build, no prepackaged stuff. Took a yeah. big, everyone was taking a big risk. Right, right. Yeah, I can imagine. And, and you know, I, I, you know, I, I honestly think because I, I toured a few of the malt houses in, in, in the UK and, and um, I think that we are, we're in a, if there was a place that would be good for malting, it's here. We have an abundance of, of, um, of, of uh, uh, you know, energy from um, renewable sources. It's a very high energy I mean, malting is a very, it uses a lot of energy, doesn't it? A lot it's, of energy. That's true. Heat. Yeah, a lot of energy to heat, uh, a lot of water. Um, and uh, I think if there's anywhere that, that we could, should be doing this, it's here in the, in the Pacific Northwest. So um, that's great. Um, the, gr the grain playground factor is a big one there too, I'll, I'll add. Like it, it essentially is, for a maltster, you have, you have so many different climates and so many different... Um, 
So, yeah, let's just leave it at climate soils. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of different variables you can work with. And then uh, you throw in all the different land grant universities that are working on it right now, just in our region. So, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I, I don't know how many of our listeners are uh, well appreciate Oregon. Oregon State is a very special place. And the, um, first of all, there aren't many people for the size of the states. You can go to places that have no, no people. And like, like, I, 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 um, uh, like we were saying, um, the diversity of climates here is, is crazy. I mean, uh, in, in Oregon, as you drive from west to east, the drop in rainfall and, and the change in, in the climate is, uh, is, is quite dramatic. So uh, um, I can imagine that you can get quite of, well, there's a lot of variables that are naturally at play here that we can, uh, that we can work with. So. Um, Bill, I'm sorry. I wonder if it'd be a good time to um, describe the malting process, especially as it goes through from pale to some of the more specialty malts for everybody. Yeah. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we? Why don't we stick with just the malting of to, the creation of pale malts? Um, who would like to do that? I feel like I've done a lot of talking. Who is? Who would like to to take that process uh, and and go through it for us in the steps? <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm happy Brian, to. You want it? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, oh, yeah, if you can hear me all right, I've just got a bunch of squawking in my, my earbuds. So, you hear me okay? We're good. You're just fine. Great. Cool. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, the way I like to think about malting is taking the like natural biological process of germination and the plant preparing itself to need sugar to work with and co-opting that for the purposes of making alcohol. <laughs> um, but uh, what, what the three stage process in which uh, the grain is steeped in water uh, such that it can be hydrated uh, and then allowed to germinate, uh, which does a, a, a pretty complex dance of things, but um, to put it simply, uh, the, the fundamental actions that are happening are the development of the enzymes that are ultimately responsible for chopping up the stored carbohydrates uh, uh, in, stored in the seed into sugar, which is what a brewer um, or a distiller is going to, 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 to want for fermentation. Um, and then also the, the modification of, of um, the husk uh, cell wall structure such that um, that grain is readily milled um, so you can get at that sugar that's stored um, in the interior of the grain. Um, so germination, letting that process advance, um, so those uh, that en enzymatic potential is maximally built up, um, and then and then stopping that process uh, by application of heat, uh, uh, the term being kilning, um, uh, uh, stopping that process just at the right spot, so you're maximizing that um, that potential. Um, for the for the for the brewer, um, but also being able to add uh, color and flavor um, through that same application of heat. And for a, a pale malt, um, that uh, that amount of of temperature and that that amount of modification is is, is significant, but not overly overly substantial. Uh, but it's just enough where you're able to. Um, develop a little bit of color, but also start bringing out some of the kind of richer cracker notes or even getting into bis uh, biscuity notes, a little bit of nuttiness, depending on the, uh, the barley varietal. But, um, but so that last, last, last stage plays that kind of two, two step role of arresting the thing that's going to set you up for, for, for fermentation, but then also priming uh, the finished product for a flavor expression um, that you you desire, and I know I want we can focus on pale, but but to answer kind of quickly the question of well, I've also heard of Munich malts or Vienna malts or crystal malts. Um, there are some things that are done differently in the germination uh, stage as far as how you manage temperature, but um, but it's really the finishing big finishing touches um, of of how you apply uh, heat in the kilning kilning process that is going to lead to that different level of, uh, 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 of, of malt. That's great. Um, I, you know, what I've, I've seen 
well, I've seen different ways of malting, uh, everything from floor malting to smaller production means to big, big, uh, you know, Simpson malt, mm. uh, massive big facilities. Um, can some, can one of you comment on, you know, uh, we've talked a bit about grain variety, uh, but what is it, what is it about the specialty malt houses? What, what can they do? that is interesting um, and unique and, and, and good for us distillers or, or brewers. Um, what are the things that a small malt house can do that, you know, a, a big one doesn't or can't, uh, can't do that's interesting? The biggest thing is turn quickly. Um, I mean, they're not, the small malt houses are not set up to, to crank out volume and drive a price down low. Uh, like accumulate inventory and drive a price down low the the small malt house is good at um filling needs uh, really quickly with new products and and um you know just being sort of the industry's pilot capacity and and testing more space so uh, there are so many different aspects of that uh, but it really starts with the grain contract or you know even the seed breeder relationship uh you need to have you know, it's this pipeline that you're trying to um, you're trying to stimulate with more pilot capacity. So pipeline starts at breeders and goes through growers, and and then you have a bunch of stuff you can do within the malt house, and then uh, brewers. Then you know they're not dealing with uh, the industry doesn't have to ask them to consume huge amounts of any of this stuff. So uh, it, it affects everyone really having having this capacity in place. Um, Question is how you how you how you scale it once once uh, you, you get something you like what that the industry likes. Yeah, that's great. I I mean, there's so many things that I would love to deep dive into from uh, from the various things you all have said. But you know, for us here, I, I, as I said, we're a single malt whiskey producer. We don't have a flagship whiskey. We make one-off batches that once they're gone, they're gone. And I love that. I love what you just said, Phil. I, I love the idea of connecting with the grower. You know, we're growing on a small scale here. We're basically, you know, 10 acres, which we could do 20 at some point, but pretty small. Um, we're using, uh, our, our grain is a, is a small, it's 10% of our grain bill. Um, but I love the idea of connecting with the, with the grower first, making it worthwhile for them, then ha having the malt house, um, you know, do to that grain what what should be done so we we don't we don't mask tastes um and uh um you know it, it fits our model really well um you know one of the things sort of totally off topic but you know we're dealing with this virus thing right now and it's going to have a massive impact on the way we probably share our beer and our whiskey or how many people we share it with um I hope that we are able to keep the smaller producers that, that, that have an interest in, in the type of thing you've just said, you know, these small batch, unique, um, what I call terroir type uh, uh, deals where we can really speak to where the grain was grown and where it was malted and why it was malted in such a way. Um, so I, I, I really think it's great. Um, should we, so the specialty malts, we, um, in our whiskey, we uh, we use specialty malts. We we use about ten percent. We use uh, um, Munich Crystal and uh, Pale Chocolate uh, specialty malt. But I wonder if one of you would mind talking about you know uh, Brian, you were you were uh, you were about to to talk a bit about the uh, what the the uh, the addition of en additional energy to the malted grain to create these specialty malts but can you can you mm -hmm. talk a bit about what what makes something what what is done to make a malt a specialty malt and, and why that's why that's important or why that matters you bet you bet yeah so um i think the kind of the most like industry like generalized uh, 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 definition of that, that that term specialty malt would be ba basically anything that isn't a Pilsner or pale malt, um, which are the two uh, lightest uh, malts where there's the, kind of the, the least uh, I intervention as it were in the kilning process uh, and, and, uh, and I should say kilning and then also roasting in, in, in the case of many, uh, many specialty malts. But the other, um, 
I think the other place where that terminology comes from is that those are malts that all are used um, to drive a special expression and only require a relatively small uh, uh, percentage of a grain bill where um, like looking at uh, crystal, crystal 60, you don't need um, a whole hell of a lot of crystal 60 to um, have its flavor and color contributions um, uh, be super prominent in a, in a beer or in a spirit. Um, and in fact, um, some of the trade-offs of getting at a specialty malt like a crystal malt is that the fermentable sugars are actually more reduced based on, 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 on that uh, malting process. So, um, so that's really kind of where that, um, on top of being a specialized product and every malt house has kind of got their own set of specialty malts that may be very um, similar in expression, but they've got their own name for it, that sort of thing to the other malt houses. Um, that, that's really where that, I think that term kind of technically lies. I know as a, as a craft malt house, um, in a certain sense, every, everything we do is, is, is specialty, including our, our base malts, our, those, those pale and pilsner malts. Um, but um, I think uh, to respond, like to kind of tuck in the question that was asked in the chat box regarding how kilning in, influences uh, flavor and sensory ex, ex, uh, 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 sensory expression. Um, the um, those specialty malts, especially as you get into uh, darker malts, um, more and more of the flavor contribution is going to be attributable attributed to what is done in the kilning process. Which actually, really, there are some lead up things that you would do in germination around. Uh, temperature of the grain bed, humidity, uh, to set yourself up to make, make a successful Munich malt, a successful crystal malt. Uh, but, but ultimately, there's some, the, 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 the activity that happens in the kiln and then in like a chocolate malt, actually, and then in a separate roasting uh, vessel. So a totally separate process um, where a lot of those um, uh, uh, flavor profiles and color profiles are happening there in contrast to saying, well, I've got two barleys and one just happens to be really dark, come out really dark in color and uh, always tastes like chocolate. We do see that in our pale malts, um, for example, our, um, our Lion and Baroness uh, barleys that we work with, um, all other things controlled, Lion tends to come out a little lighter in color, even in those, those lighter malts. But once you move up into the specialty malts, you're doing a lot more control for those, those profiles by what you're doing in the malt house rather than the, the varietal contribution. Yeah, that's great. I, you know, um, we, we don't, I mean, I, so so many things that I'd like to talk to you about more, ah. but we, we've only got a certain amount of time. Um, the pale malt, you know, I, I, I certainly don't want people to think that we, we we have a lot of respect for the pale malt as well. I mean, obviously we we we're we're big on the specialty malts. We think it it does add some unique flavors to our whiskey, and and uh, um, uh, we intend to keep doing keep using them. But the pale malts as well. We did our um, second big grouping of whiskey, which is about to come on the market in a year, with a different pale malt. We we initially used. Uh, Washington Pale as our uh, base malt for our um, what we called our Evergreen series, but our next uh, oh here we go Lone Star series. Look at that! I even know the presentation. This is great. My wife was giving me a hard time the last time, but uh, anyways, um, the Lone Star collection we uh, we use Golden Promise instead of uh, um, Washington Pale. Golden Promise is well, Pat would probably all maybe all of you would probably know, but. Uh, Golden Promise was the base malt used for most of the scotches in Scotland, and I would imagine probably Ireland as well, um, until the higher yield malts were, or grain, uh, uh, barleys were used, a chariot and so on. Uh, and Golden Promise is a very nice, uh, very flavorful uh, pale malt. Uh, so, and and uh, we're, we've, we have whiskey now made with uh, that as our as our base malt, the Golden Promise, and uh, it's coming of age now, especially in some of those uh, new oak casts, and it's going to be really special. I, uh, I'm super stoked about it. Um, so the pale malts as well, we have a ton of respect for their flavor, uh, added flavor, um, in addition to the, to the specialty malts. So I wonder, uh, sorry, would be guys, a good time. There was a question that I posed that I was actually asked to unmute and asked. Um, oh, great. Does, Perfect. 
does each grain have its own malting process? I can take that one. <laughs> Perfect. Go for it, Brian. Um, Please. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yes and no. So um, assuming that you've got a grain that is within the realm of, of what would be defined as malt quality in terms of its germination energy, its protein. I won't bore you with the specifics right now, but <laughs> assuming it fits roughly within a performance ballpark that we're looking for in raw grain, uh, for whatever malt recipe we're looking to hit, a pale malt, uh, a Munich malt, a crystal malt, our initial approach in the malt house would be very similar from variety to variety. Um, so we're going to be doing approximately the same thing. That said, every variety's got its own quirks and differences. The rate at which, like how quickly it germinates, uh, how evenly it hydrates, um, how quickly it takes on color. So what, what we have to really be experts at is understanding those nuanced differences. That, so when we say uh, we've got our pale, uh, our pale target, which is going to be between two and three love a bond, We've got a certain extract we're trying to hit. We've got a, a, a flavor profile that we're after that uh, if we're uh, putting lion into production versus baroness, there are differences that we've adapted over time to our hydration regime would be a good example between those two barleys. We, we, uh, we spend about four more hours, uh, over, which is, uh, you know, uh, like an 18 to 20 hour process. Normally we, we've added four hours to most lion we work with. Uh, compared to the Baroness, just because we find it modifies better during germination if we do that. So it's the same process and it's roughly the same parameters, but different varieties behave differently and, and then a, certainly different crops uh, uh, behave differently as well. So you've really, you know, our, what we've learned working with our 2019 harvest, once we get the 2020 harvest in late this year, we're going to go right back to the notes and start making those adjustments again. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. So basically, it sounds like you're you start out with a science. You've got the science down for the beginning, but mm -hmm. after that, it really becomes an art because you have to totally you know, kind of observe what each of the grains is doing and work with it from there. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Awesome. Well, also, Thanks. Yeah, that's the uh, it, it's it, that that opens or that uh, brings up a number of points. I mean. Um, there's variability in the same grain year to year, where that grain is grown, uh, then how we treat it, uh, whether we, we treat it as a, or, or uh, malt it as a pale malt or specialty. And uh, so, so many variables. It, it's, it's, I mean, uh, I know that corn is a great source of sugar for, for whiskey, uh, same with rye, but um, barley is quite special. And I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite psyched with what, uh, with the things that we're going to be able to, uh, pass on to consumers over the next few years. Um, I wonder if Cody, is Cody here? Is, is, where's Cody? Is he uh, available? Where is he? I can't see him. Hello, Cody? Well, I think he must have dropped off, but it would be okay. great to uh, um, talk about each, maybe our malts and, and, and why you chose it. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I was doing a bunch of uh, test beers. I did a bunch of the teas. Um, I, uh, I, ta I, I obviously tasted a number of whiskeys. As I, as I was saying, I really liked some of the early, and, and now there have been a lot more American single malts, but some of the early, I loved Stranahan's, uh, St. George's, uh, uh, McCarthy's, um, and then uh, Westland. And so I, you know, I was, I was obviously finding out what they had used for their, for their whiskeys. Most of the American single malt producers are using some specialty malts as well as their base pale malt. Um, and uh, I mean, the reason I settled on it, I liked the flavors from each of these various things. I mean, um, you know, the, the, uh, the various people here now who have spoken would, would, uh, have have, a, have as much or much more than I would have to say, but these various specialty malts have some very unique flavors. Um, definitely, you know, crystal Munich, but the bread flavor biscuit, the uh, the pale chocolate is a very special one. I was I was I wasn't quite sure if I should use pale chocolate. Pale chocolate, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a very very dark, almost black malt. It's it's the malt that's used to make stouts and the darker ales. 
it has a ton of flavors. Uh, it's called pale chocolate. So obviously there are some chocolate flavors, but there are also some very, uh, I mean, the grain is really, really, there's a ton of energy added to that grain, to that malt. And um, so there are some more astringent flavors, even some, uh, uh, what, what some might describe as smoky flavors. And those, you know, we talked this, about this last week. Um, so first of all, smoky flavors aren't for everyone. Not everybody likes smoky whiskey. I, I do, and I know there are many people who do, especially malt whiskey uh, appreciators. But not everybody likes sm a smoky taste. And um, it's amazing to see the changes in these various flavors, the malt flavors, over time. Um, what's really fun to watch is having this whiskey and, and observing how the nose changes over time. Um, and it's fun if, if people are able to compare the various three batches. These three batches that we've released are made <clears throat> with the same exact grain bill in the same place. They're aged in the same barrels to begin with, but then the last few years are different from the various batches. And the difference is, is, is crazy. And uh, you, you can see some themes that come through from the grain bill and, and from the, the distilling uh, and the yeast, but that there are some massive changes that occur over time. And, uh, and, and, and as, as, it, as it pertains to the pale chocolate, that smoky flavor does really change over time. So it's, it's, uh, it's quite fun to watch. So let's go on to our next slide there now. Um, we were going to, uh, I think, talk about... Um, Maybe at the farm. Yeah, so I, we're really stoked to be able to grow bar we have a farm. We have a farm here that was previously used for growing cherries and apples. And we tried the cherries and apples for a while, but we're a very small farm. And, and as some of you may be aware, it's extremely challenging to... Uh, to have a profitable uh, orchard that's as small as we are. Um, so I, I wasn't sure if we could grow barley. Uh, turns out we can. We can grow many, many kinds of grass here well. And uh, with Pat Hayes' guidance initially and um, various others, we elected to grow full pint here. Um, and maybe Pat, would you mind uh, describing or or giving us a sense for the history of full pint and uh, why you may have recommended uh, for us to start with that one? Pat had to jump off Phil to go to a Mother's Day thing, so uh, oh, maybe right, right, it is Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we so full pint was developed at OSU. Um, and uh, it grows very well here, it turns out. It, there are some nuances to the, to the grain. It's, um, once it's near maturity, it's very sensitive to water, so we have to be careful to harvest it when, it's, uh, when the humidity level is low enough but not leaving it. So we, uh, we're, we're harvesting typically before, July, before the beginning of July, end of June, beginning of July, depending on when we plant and how the growing season is. We irrigate here. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite fun. We've just used that barley now in a, uh, whiskey collaboration with McCarthy's unmalted. Um, so sort of an Irish take. Um, and, um, we're really excited that that whiskey won't be ready for a few years, but, uh, it'll be really fun to see the impact that that um, unmalted grain has on the uh, taste of the whiskey. Um, so yeah, we're going at the farm and this is our combine. It gets used once a year. I get to fire it up every now and again, but it's, uh, they're amazing machines. They basically are factories on wheels. And, um, when this thing fires up, it's quite impressive. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's quite fun to have, uh, to have the combine and, uh, and to use it. Um, and it works, it really does work. So we're, uh, we're, we're psyched for that. And, we're interested in the future to grow other variety grain or uh, grain varieties, um, but full pine is what we started with. So we'll we'll go from we'll go from there. Next slide. So this is the farm. This is the barn. This is where we age our whiskey. The upper floor is not used yet. Uh, that's where the hay used to be kept. The lower two floors is where we uh, age our whiskey. Uh, the, the, this floor here where I'm standing on is a, the, the whole barn is non-temperature controlled. It's, a, it's just a barn, it's not insulated. And so this gets the big hot and cold swings and then the lower level is uh, somewhat of a cellar, at least um, half of the, uh, 
of the of that floor and the lower floor is underground so the temperature swings are much less and uh, it turns out uh, hood river is a really nice place to age whiskey it's not too hot it's not too cold it's not too humid or dry it's just perfect and um um so you know to be located in a place where we actually grow barley and now to connect with these um, uh, malt houses and, and uh, people who are interested in in malting these small uh, grain uh, grains for distilling is super nice and uh, i i think this uh this is a very symbiotic relationship we've got going here and uh, um yeah, it's been really nice to get all of you together today and, and uh, chat about the various things that you're interested in. Do we Thanks a lot uh, for having us, Phil, yeah. Yeah. Sandra, Great. Sasha. It's, it's a long day. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any wrap-up questions? I don't know whether, Greg, or you want to unmute yourself and ask Phil about the malt selection or if anyone else has a burning question. I want to be really mindful of our time. Everyone good? I think we're good. This is uh, this is great, you all. I, I um, we've had connections to varying degrees. I mean, Pat and I talked years ago, and I was super happy to to uh, get his response. And uh, I know uh, Bill and Brian Campbell. It's been very nice to connect with you guys. I hope uh, I hope we can have you here at the farm. It's um, this time of year is is pro is one of my favorites. The place is exploding with new growth. The, the days are hot today. We were into the low 80s. The nights are cold. It's nice to cook outside and, and hang out outside. Um, so when this whole virus business uh, recedes and we can uh, all uh, uh, connect and at least, at least uh, be in the same room together, <laughs> um, it will be a real treat to have you here and see what we're doing uh, uh, for sure. Yeah, keep cutting those mountain bike trails. <laughs> I know. Trying Absolutely. to get my son to help maintain them is a bit of a challenge, but uh, it'll, it'll be fun. <laughs> but uh, we'll sign off there now. Everybody have a good Sunday evening. Uh, we're going to do this weekly. We'll choose various topics. Uh, we'd love your input on choosing topics and certainly how, how you found these uh, discussions, if they were helpful or entertaining for you all. Um, but And also take care of all yourselves uh, uh, in this funny time now as we uh, – hopefully start to open up again. But uh, yeah, good evening. Thanks so much. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks for having us. Good night. Thanks, Take care. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you.